Okay, there we go. Thank you. That was, I know, you know. Gloomy weather and gloomy weather, right? I get it. But come on, you got to keep on keeping on. Uh, so I will say, I meant to say this, but obviously on a Monday, I kind of got, you know, a little ker- kerflumped. Uh, but I did want to also point out that you do have a lecture exercise. Uh, so the big thing here, uh, so I said on the piazza, oh, it's going to be a problem set. Mm, you know, I did some sh- uh, shifting around for that. So, uh, But you do have a lecture exercise. Uh, specifically, the reason why is because what we're going to get into today is we're going to be talking about prologue. So we're going to kind of introduce a new programming language, programming paradigm to you. Uh, and, you know, I want you to get familiar with it because, you know, I'm just immediately going to start throwing you to the wolves of working with it. So uh, it's not terribly difficult. Uh, again, um, you've got a file that you're asked to download, this movies.pl file. All it stores in there is a bunch of first-order logic predicates. So you can see, hey, you know, there's American Hustle is has a, the director... David O. Russell, uh, the director of Avengers Age of Ultron is Joss Whedon. And you can keep on going on. There's, you can see it's got movie, director, genre, uh, who starred in what. It's a lot of stuff. So, you know, uh, who, who, where's Elsa? There it is. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that. Adina? Adina. Adina played Elsa in Frozen or starred as Elsa in Frozen. So uh, the big idea here is getting comfortable, getting familiar with it. Um, Specifically, the idea, as you can see, I see some people have gotten uh, some attempts, is loading through it. But hey, looking at the syntax, can you kind of process and work through and understand that syntax? So in what year was the movie American Hustle released? Sure, yes, you can just go on IMDb for that. or, you know, you can look in here, right? Where, where's American Hustle? It would be in the movie genre. Oh, look, there it is, right? Okay, I got you. I got you for these. But I don't care about that actual answer. I care, how would I find it? How would I query it? And again, this is stuff that we're going to be talking about today. But uh, again, this kind of question is like, well, who, how do I get these, informa- this, these results, if you will? Then after you kind of finish this first page, the second page is actually starting to work through it. Can you build some queries? Can you build some uh, uh, first order logic queries using Prolog uh, and whatnot? Uh, Reason why is even though, you know, uh, this is almost like me giving you the the, the spoiler or the, the teaser uh, for problem set five. I know, I haven't given you four yet, and I'm already talking about five. You know how I work. You know how I work, right? Uh, but again, make sure to kind of get that familiar with. But with that in mind, this is where I want to kind of, we're, ex- we're, we're continuing down that first order logic kind of rabbit hole. Right? We are still talking about logical agents. And if you kind of think about what we were doing on Monday, it was, it was this kind of like I was just introducing the syntax and the structure and the semantics. But like I didn't really give you the answer of like how to do it. And that was kind of, you know, it was just like a uh, amorphous blob. Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today is this idea of like, well, OK, if I have facts in a knowledge base, and I have rules in a knowledge base. Can I make queries to that knowledge base? And so how we talked about this was this idea of something known as unification. Is there a way I can look at two sentences? And is there a substitution that I can make with these two sentences? That way they are now equal. So if we look at this kind of example here, right? I have two sentences. Uh, You know some X. And then you know the Muffin Man. The Muffin Man, right? So now the question becomes, okay, can I make a substitution of all of my variables or my variables, X, can I make a substitution with X such that I can get 
these sentences to say the same thing? Well, yes. How would I do that? Again, if you're remembering kind of that structure, we can produce a set. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying is, hey, I want to substitute X. I want to substitute that variable, that amorphous variable that you have going on, and I'm going to call it, or I'm going to instantiate a term, the muffin man, right? And then, well, okay, fine, cool, yeah, that would make them equal to each other. But you can see we can continue to expand on this. What if I have variables floating in both of the sentences? I can still make substitutions, right? So in this situation, right, I still have that X, uh, Ford saves something, and Y saves Arthur. Is there a way for me to substitute that X and that Y and make these sentences equal to each other. And yes, that's exactly what we can do. You can see, hey, if I swapped out that X for Arthur, right? If I put a little Arthur there, and if I swapped out that Y for Ford, or put a little Ford there, right? I would have Ford saves Arthur, Ford saves Arthur. And I would have the same sentence. Good? Yeah? Following me? All right. So what happens when I cannot make that substitution? Sometimes this is occurring because, right, you know, sometimes we may find ourselves with rules or facts that don't pan out. They don't work, right? <laughs> Multiple substitutions are fine. Uh, so in this situation, right, what if I had the predicate mother? Elizabeth is the mother to some X. Okay, fine. And then X is the mother to Charles. Now the question becomes, can I make a substitution of X that would make these sentences the same? And the issue is no, right? If I substituted X for Charles, Elizabeth is the mother of Charles. Well, the problem is this is also using that same variable, and this will start to kind of become important as we translate this into now code, right? Well, Charles is the mother of Charles. That's not the same as Elizabeth is the mother of Charles. And so as a consequence, what we would say in this situation is, no, no, you cannot, false, fail, right? You're unable to swap my variables in such a way that I would be able to take, do that, tackle this. If, however, let's say, mm -hmm. unify... What am I doing there? Mother. Elizabeth. X. Uh, what would I get? If I attempted to do unify mother Elizabeth X, father Y X. That would be a fail because mother and father are not the same thing. Right. It would be a fail. This predicate is not the same as this predicate. So it doesn't matter if I was to magically be like, oh, swap Y with Elizabeth and X with whatever I want, right? The problem is that predicates don't work. What about what would be produced? Come on, come on. Substitute uh, Elizabeth for mother and uh, I guess Charles for X. So not Elizabeth for mother, Elizabeth for. There we are. Yeah, so in this situation, I'll change colors. In this situation, I can unify these two sentences by making two substitutions. Let's substitute Y. 
with Elizabeth, with Elizabeth, and then let's substitute X, in our case, with Charles. That's not a curly. So thinking about it, right, think, oh, okay, I swap out that X, I write in Charles. I take that Y, I swap it with Elizabeth. I take that X, I swap it with Charles. Does that sentence equal that sentence? Yes, it does. And that's the point. Yeah. This is where typically you've got some kind of prompt going on that's going to like ask. But if I had, you know, just in theory, since I had two X's going on there, if I had swapped them with Adam, if let's arbitrarily say that Adam exists in this universe, since they were both originally. Since they were both originally X, oh well, yeah, that 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 would work. Good, good, you're all good already. Cause, uh -huh, there we are. All right, I'm gonna give you a little activity. I think I gotta unlock because we're still you still you technically have three minutes before it unlocks. So give me half a second. Uh, you get to see a little bit behind the curtain of what's going on in my world. Uh, let's see, there's the activity. Let's hit settings. Let's go down to restrict. Let's get rid of that. We hit save. You refresh your page, you should now have that activity. And essentially, I want to ask, hey, can I make substitutions for, you know, parent XY, parent Fred Pebbles, parent Anakin X, parent Mufasa Simba, likes X, 411. Everyone likes 411. Uh, everyone likes something. Everyone likes, or Y likes, 411, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we'll take, this one shouldn't take too long, so I'll give you one, two, three, four, five, six. I'll give you till 319, so six minutes, one minute each. And we are back. Let me see how you did. All righty. So, yeah, uh, I don't know what that is. Uh, so we're not, so, okay, uh, we're not looking uh, to just based on what I'm seeing here. So it's not that we're trying to say, yes, you can. It is where we're trying to actually find those substitutions. So something to be mindful of uh, there. Other people got kind of the structure nicely done. Uh, let's see. No, we are... A little too many fails going on there. Uh, no, don't laugh. Uh, you know, uh, we've got some. Here's where I was kind of definitely wanted to double check, right? If we're looking at, if we tried to make that swap of X to, you know, with Simba, then what we've essentially created was the fact uh, Anakin is the parent of Simba, and we don't have that in the knowledge base. That's not a fact. You know, I know. Uh, you know, if you haven't watched The Lion King or the Star Wars trilogies, there's your weekend, right? Uh, not the, not the live-action CGI Lion King. Don't, uh, nobody, that doesn't exist. Anyways, my point being, uh, again, the idea is there's nothing I could swap this X for that would make this equal to the other side. That's kind of what we're looking at here. Uh, is specifically that kind of making sure that these statements can match. Uh, so uh, overall, it looks like for the most part, we've got everything else. If you got them wrong, you know, uh, T is whatever I assume it's tile. It, well, yeah, technically T can be whatever you want because uh, this is where it's like, eh, you know. Uh, the other option is you could just do 
S for dirty in, you know, because that would also technically unify them. They'd both be having a variable. It wouldn't be a full unification because obviously you have a floating variable still in the space. But well, as we'll see in a, a second, that's almost sort of like step one of this entire process. Now, specifically, you noticed how it was still human decided, right? You were still using your logic brain here. It wasn't an algorithm. It wasn't a methodology. Literally, I just told you, you know, swap a, a, a letter for a name or a word or something like that. So the idea becomes, right, we're, we're forming these queries. We're forming, we're, we're essentially asking questions about the knowledge base, right? I produce a question in first order logic kind of territory. Hey, uh, clean Wally tile 24 or does Wally clean tile 24? And there's an entire, you know, rule set that I have built that has facts and rules to it. And specifically then what I'm looking at is can I find an answer, right? Can I look at these and go, oh, I know that is a true statement or I know that is a false statement. So how we start to kind of go about this is, can I make substitutions in my rule set? Can I substitute, right, clean A, B? In fact, let me just write it out, right? I think this one doesn't work, so right. Can I unify... Clean Wally tile what twenty four with clean A B. Again, this is what you were just doing. Can I make a substitution for A and B and make it so that these sentences match each other? Now, specifically, it's not just that I can make these substitutions arbitrarily, right? When I make these substitutions, they still have to maintain the rules of the universe, the rules of my knowledge base so far. And that's kind of where we start to get into what we call inference. Now, this is where you're going to hear a giant $5 word. I like to say it because you'll never be graded on it. But what you can... Look at this entire sub, uh, substitution process is as a subsumption lattice. Ooh, look at that, look at that. I'm making y'all smarter every day. What's happening, right? When I see sort of this open, ambiguous, floating space, the idea you can think about is what are the substitutions I could make? Now, this is a completely separate uh, example, but I might be able to substitute, hey, X, let's substitute that with Adam. Or let me substitute Y with ice cream. Right? It's October. Ice cream is still, you know, a thing. Right? It's typically buy one, get one free at this time. This is why I like ice cream during October. Right? But my point is, you notice how I can make one substitution, but I'm not done. Right? I can continue to make additional substitutions on sort of this sub-answered question. I can make one substitution. Okay, fine. That helped answer some of my questions or build out some of my, my unification. But I, I can also make additional substitutions. And why I present that in this structure with that big fa you know, $5 word is, notice what I have formed. That looks eerily similar to a graph-like structure. Don't you, as computer science students who've taken 316, know how to traverse graph-like structures? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I hopefully, you know, that was a prerequisite for this class, right? No, I, so this idea that, hey, we have been taught and we understand that graphs exist and there is a process for traversing those graphs in some way. Well, again, right? Your edges are just your moves, your moves, air quotes, your substitutions, your individual substitutions as you build uh, through your inference. And so that's where we can look at it of like, well, how do I do that inference, right? 
I just magically was just like staring at my, my terms and, you know, answered it. But how would I build that out? And this is where I'm building out a little bit of a, a more complex knowledge base, right? Wally, okay, tile 24. Now, let's add in all, you know, a bunch more facts. Some of them may be irrelevant to my actual query, right? That happens. So in this case, I have that uh, rule one, Bird Kowalski. That's Kowalski. If you haven't seen Madagascar, Thank you, thank you. The, I, have, I still have to ask these questions. I don't know. Is Madagascar relevant with the kids? There's a Christmas special. Okay. First off, I barely knew Madagascar, and now there's a Christmas special. Anyways, right, again, okay, well, Kowalski's a bird. Tweety's a bird. That's my era, right? Tweety is yellow. Kowalski's a penguin. Cat, Sylvester. Sylvester's a cat. Well, if something is a cat, that would imply that it hates the snow. If something is a penguin, that would imply it loves the snow. A bird, anything that could be a bird, implies it can fly. He was on a plane at one point. That's technically, anyways. And if we've got a bird... And that thing that was a bird is also yellow. And a completely different thing is a cat. That would imply the cat will chase the bird. Now we ask you a little query. Does Sylvester chase Tweety? And again, the process is not, oh, let me just do it in my head. It's how can we build out a process that we could design a system to then do? Right? That's, that's kind of the, the important part. So as we're kind of looking at this, how would we think about that? Well, I have these facts. I have these rules. I have nine facts and rules that make up my knowledge base. And the way you can think about it is, well, those are getting loaded into memory, right? How, how do you build them? We'll get there, right? But, okay, I have these facts about my world. Let me load them into memory. Well, then what? Well, then I also have some evaluations, right? I have a number of variables in my knowledge base. I have a number of terms already known. Kowalski is a term. Tweety is a term. Sylvester is a term, right? So now what I am essentially doing is saying, well, let me look at all those variables, and let me look at all my terms that I happen to know about, right? Those are the only valid terms in my world. There is no atom in this knowledge base. It's not like I can make those up anymore. We're, we're now focusing on only what I have at my disposal. And what we could do is essentially we could try and see what types of inferences or new facts we can create out of our knowledge base, right? So how do we go about doing that? So we want to still determine, this is still our query, right? Again, think about it as, this is all loaded into memory. We're now trying to answer this question. And by doing that, we've mapped out all our variables and our terms. And wouldn't you know it, we're about to do a loop. Right? We're about to kind of go through and find all the permutations of variable to term. Case in point, what if I make the substitution Q and Kowalski? What if I say, oh, OK, let me. Can I, can I, <laughs> can I? Can I make this substitution? Well, I mean, yes, you know, this is the being pedantic with English. Yes, you can, but what we have to then do is go, okay, I've just made that substitution. Is everything in my knowledge base still true? Right? That's the important part because, again, as we make these substitutions, we're trying to find right, substitutions that would make this a true statement. So again, we make that substitution. All right, let's swap out Q for Kowalski. Now what we have to do is we have to reevaluate our knowledge base to ensure 
everything still okay? But here's the problem, right? All right, that first attempt, right? Swapping Q with Kowalski. Well, that would also create some new fact that Kowalski was a cat. Do I have in the knowledge base that as a fact? No. So now I'm trying to create something, because again, notice this is a rule going on here. So, hey, I'm, tr I'm trying to like, make deductions on facts that don't exist. And so that's a failure. But does that mean we stop? No, it means we just move on to the next permutation. Q Kowalski didn't work. What about W Kowalski, right? Okay, let's do W Kowalski. Let's swap out the W for the Kowalski. And all right, can we find anything in here that would allow us to use the W? And yeah, right? there's rule eight. Rule eight, if we swapped out W for Kowalski, we're now sort of making a, a you know, we're checking, hey, Bird Kowalski, is that, does that exist in the knowledge base? Yeah, it's up there, that's rule one. So, oh, hey, you know, oh, I have the ability to do this substitution because I'm not violating the rule by making that substitution. And now look what new information gets created. If I substitute W for Kowalski, that would say, oh, well, for Bird Kowalski, that implies Kowalski can fly. And I've created new knowledge about my world. There's my saying yes, so I am creating what we call latent predicates, ones that don't actually physically exist, but could be deduced you know, through reasoning. And so what I've done is I have just produced a new fact. If I combine rule one, I'll just call them rules or facts. You know, if I combine fact one with rule eight and make the substitution, W. Kowalski, what I will produce or what I'm able to produce is that Kowalski can fly. Yeah? Okay. All right. All right. Okay. We're making deductions. But what's the problem with Kowalski flying? Well, that doesn't matter. Him being a penguin does not matter. It's something else. What's our original question? Well, specifically, what was the question? Does Sylvester chase Tweety? So I'm producing facts that don't really answer, you know, that, yes, that creates a new uh, fact in our knowledge base, uh, and here's us, but it, it, that's not helping us answer the question at all. So, yes, it's beneficial, or I won't call it, yes, it is something we can deduce, but now it's almost treated like a dead end, right? You're doing your search, you're doing your breadth, or bra, uh, uh, breadth for search, and then you hit a dead end, right? Oh, I, I kept on making progress. I kept making progress. But now, oh, what? I can't do anything with this. I can't, you know, there's nothing in the rules that, uh, you know, takes this can fly and that deduces new knowledge or I can use in my original query. Uh, so that doesn't work. And you saw this. This You, you remember discrete math? Hmm. I told you we were going to be back. You remember deep thought in discrete math? Yeah. You remember how your instructor pleaded with you, begged you not to do forward chaining? Anyone? No? No? We begged you not to. We, we begged you to do proof by contradiction. <gasps> oh, I heard it. <laughs> Right. If you do not do proof by contradiction, you're doing forward chaining. And why I mention that is notice, I'm creating irrelevant facts. I'm having to hit dead ends constantly. But, okay, we'll, we'll fix that in a little bit, right? So, again, we're at a dead end. So, we're back to our, uh, you know, 
search our permutation. Now, for my sake, I am going to skip ahead because you do not want to watch me evaluate all of these. So we're just going to swap, you know, boom. We finally get to uh, swapping Z with Tweety. So we finally just go, hey, if I swap out Z with Tweety, what can I find here? OK, well, if I make that substitution, right, what rules are changing? Or what rules can I use in this substitution to produce new information? Eight and nine. Huh? Eight and nine. Eight. Well, I don't really need eight for this one. I can, that, that's where, like, yes, I could, that would produce new information, but kind of irrelevant. But I can do nine. Now, if I were to make swaps, because, you know, I swap out those Zs, what other facts would I also need to double check to make sure that they are still true? Huh? And? We haven't got there yet. Tweety's yellow and Tweety is a bird. So we, if we combined line two or rule two, rule three, and rule nine, well, again, those three rules combined with the substitution of Z for Tweety or, or Tweety for Z would produce now Tweety is a bird and Tweety is yellow, and we still really haven't answered the Q cat question, would imply Q will chase Tweety. Okay, we're already, we're halfway there. We're halfway there. Right? That's one step along the way, but we're not quite done yet. Right? We haven't answered the question, but we're almost there. How many variables in different rules having different names? What's the point of the variables? Is there any specific reason why it has to be like cat x, paints no x, can't, can't we use that x for penguin x plus no x? Oh, so we're actually going to, so the question is, can't we just use x here, right? The answer is no. Uh, and in fact, the, the idea behind it is if I make that substitution, I'm changing every x across all of the knowledge base. Uh, and in fact, we'll see that in action as like, as we work through this, we will find out, oh, you know, that, that's actually a step along the process of converting our these as rules into something. Like, again, think of it from a program sense. Cat implies hate snow. We still haven't really fixed this fact that there's implications floating about. When we do our conversions later on, like that, making sure that these are unique variables for each rule actually will happen. Good question, though. Uh, so we're at least stuck. We're, we're, we're halfway there. But what we've essentially produced is sort of its own rule, right? Rule 10. It's not full, but, right, well, you know, Tweety is a bird and Tweety is yellow. Those things are true. So all I need now is that if there is some Q that I can replace and it be a cat, I can deduce or imply that that cat would chase my yellow bird Tweety. So yeah, I've produced these new, I've got my confirmed predicates. I'm, uh, I'm building out my steps. But finally, well, hey, like I said, if I can make a substitution for Q and make sure that it's still a cat, I'm golden. And so how would I do that? Well, if I look at line five, Okay, right. Again, I'm still brute forcing this. So you notice, technically, now that I've produced that rule, I'm still iterating through my variables to find substitutions. So in this situation, hey, you know, I see 5 and 10, right, that, that rule we just created with the substitution of Q for Sylvester, well, that would make our swap of cat to Q, or cat to Sylvester, which we confirm, right? That works. And so what we can deduce 
at the end of the day, based on sort of this brute force of iterating all the permutations of variable to term, we can finally find two substitutions. If we substitute Z with Tweety and Q for Sylvester, I would be able to say, yes, in fact, Sylvester does chase Tweety. <gasps> I know. Oh, wait, I went too far. So did it work? Yeah, it worked. Notice this is where, hey, that it, it found the solution. So why am I, you know, why, why am I going to continue teaching today kind of stuff, right? Uh, yeah, it works. It'll get you a solution if it's possible, right? It's, it's no different than our, our other types of searches. We can find it. Uh, but the problem is because we're doing this brute force approach, we're essentially creating rules that we may not need. They're just irrelevant, but we, we created them uh, like the bird can fly, right? We don't need that for our query, but we created it. We had to store that in memory, and that's now something we are also having to check all the time, right? We don't need that. Also, you can see, hey, uh, we got to keep on checking the rules. We're essentially just doing this giant depth first search uh, the entire time. And you remember those depth first searches. It's maybe I'm doing a little too many unnecessary iterations only to be on a dead end or where the solution is somewhere super easy, you know, down the road. So again, this is where, you know, while you were in your three, uh, Discrete math is 246, 226, 226, right? When you were doing deep thought, you also got to introduce this idea of proof by contradiction. And proof by contradiction also goes by a different term, backward chaining. Now, we're, we're not quite there yet. We'll, we'll really get into the ugliness of proof by contradiction in, you know, I think next week. But at least for our sake right now, okay, let's just do backward chaining. What's the difference? Well, with backward chaining, all I'm going to start looking at is, if that is my query, what rules does this query need to be true? Let's just go ahead and assume it's a true statement. We're making an assumption going on here. Rather than let's arbitrarily look at all permutations to see if what our statement was true. Instead, let's go ahead and assume it's just, okay, well, it's, assume it's true. Just, all right, if it is true, what rules also have to be true? And so this is where, when you're doing backward chaining, if I looked at, uh, you know, chase, Kowalski, I know how to spell Sylvester. What would need to be true for this to be a true statement? Well, what is the first fact that would need to exist in my knowledge base? Kowalski's got a bird. Got it. Kowalski. Must be a bird. Is it a bird? Is that a true statement? Yeah. Awesome. Great. So now we move on. Now, someone else, what would also have to be true? Kowalski would have to be yellow. Do we have that in there? No. It's penguin. They, the bink's yellow, but what I need. No. So what we've just notice what I'm, I've found here. Just with two steps. I didn't have to swap out variables. I didn't have to brute force everything. But just through what do I need to make this true? Oh, these rules, this rule was good. This rule was not. Well, do I, does it even matter what the next one is? No, because I've already shown, 
you can't do this. You, it doesn't work because specifically, right? So if we expand, here's me drawing that out. So we found, uh, oh, why did I pick cat for that? Sure. Uh, I'm, I will fix that. Uh, oh, right, right, right. Kowalski's chasing Sylvester. Oh, okay. All right. I, I, I see what I did there. I wrong. See, we all did it. I asked, did Kowalski chase Sylvester? This is why you sit down and you do it by hand and you don't do it in your brain because where's my thingy? All right. Start all over. Do, do, do. The first rule would be, uh oh. I can't do that. Sylvester's not a bird. And that's what we're seeing here. Boom. Or Kowalski, I will fix the slide. Ugh. Right? Uh, yeah, cool. I'm, I'm looking at the cat one first here. That's really more, more my point is just like pointing out, right, this is not a true statement in the knowledge base. So rather than continuing down the train, let's just stop. Like I, I, this is short-circuiting in essence. So that doesn't work. So let's try a different iteration. Does Sylvester chase Kowalski? Sylvester is a cat. Right, good. That works. That works for us. Kowalski is a bird. Now, right? Yeah, okay, I found two of the rules work. The last one is Kowalski yellow. Well, after my embarrassment, we already proved that that's not true, right? Oh, so after three just checks, boom, I already know that this is a false statement. I don't need to deduce anything else. I don't need to check anything else. All right. So now our last one. Yeah. Do you have like another rule in the knowledge base that was like, if um, that said like the same thing as that, except instead of saying yellow Z, it said like penguin Z, and then it also implied chase Q Z. So, if and only. so in theory, yes. However, we don't have that. So we're just trying to determine like if. If we know for certain that this is true, and then we just like say false if it could be false. All we're doing is we're basing our query off of what we know in the knowledge base. So again, think program kind of thing. It does. There's no extra inference. Yes, I'm using like Looney Tunes and pulp, pop culture references, but at the end of the day, the, if these are the only facts that my universe knows. If I'm adding more rules, well, then I'm adding more rules. I'm changing the knowledge base entirely, right? And that's, again, we'll actually talk about that in knowledge representation uh, on the f sense of, like, building out all these rules is hard because we have to think them up, and that's, that's not a good thing. <laughs> but at least on our sense, what we're looking at is, I think we were right here, right? We're only looking at, do I have yellow Kowalski in the knowledge base? If I don't, then the answer is false. Right? There is no like, oh, let me you know, change it to something else. That, that, that goes beyond the scope of our, our reasoning. That's now trying to make, that's trying to change the rules along the way, which we cannot do. So the last one we have is, again, now just does Sylvester chase Tweety? Well, Sylvester's a cat, so we can keep going. Tweety is a bird, so we keep going. Tweety yellow. Tweety yellow. Yes, we did have that. That was in the rules. And now that I have, uh, the way I want you to think about this is, now that I have no other recursive calls or uh, recursive substitutions that I need to make, I've satisfied all of the, I'll call them constraints, but I've satisfied all of the prerequisites for my deduction to chase Tweety. 
And as a result, I can return back true. Yes, Sylvester would chase Tweety. Questions? I know, you know, you've been picking my brain the entire time, but questions on what we've just done. Questions on when you will do this on the midterm? Is this the same thing as proof by contradiction? Not quite. So it is not the same as proof by contradiction, but just to, I don't want to terrify you quite yet, but where are you? I'll just go ahead and scare you for next week for a second. Ah, downloading, virus scanning, Bob. Uh, but here's where I terrify you next week. Where is that proof by contradiction? Contradiction. Boom. Right there. I know. Can't wait. Now that I've terrified you. Oh. So with backward training, it's... A faster method. That's the, the, the kind of key reason why we talk about it. But why did we even talk about it? Well, this is where I'm going to introduce a new language, prologue. Prologue, here's how I'm going to frame prologue for you. Prologue is a very old language. Are you going to ever use it in your job? A very niche job. Prologue is a research and logic-based language. It is not a Java. It is not a Python. It is not meant to open a file and process things and, you know, give you a good user experience. No, it is designed to do backward chaining. It is designed to essentially serve as a programming language that can do what we were just doing. All of the substitutions, all of that, you know, stuff that you were just kind of working through, programmatically, that's what Prolog's designed to do. Now, why I present it is it is still very well used in AI. Even though it is this niche old language, right, Prolog is used by IBM Watson, used by Oracle. It is part of the reasoning that these ABI, AI agents are doing. Why? Because, right, let me look into my knowledge or my rules, especially if we're thinking like IBM Watson was originally built, uh, not originally built, but one of the things that they're doing with IBM Watson is medical analysis. So reading through medical uh, journals, you know, well, that's English. English is a structured sentence. Structured sentence, right? Uh, and well, oh, can I deduce knowledge out of it? Can I draw facts from it? And we'll actually see that a little bit later. But the idea is this is where it becomes a very powerful tool. And it's much more, uh, this language is much more of it's a good thing to have in your back pocket. Again, where will you find the use for it? Very niche situations of where you need to make deductions as part of your workflow. Uh, heavily still used in academia uh, for research, right? Again, because it's like, can I, uh, hold on. You remember when you had to learn probability in 226? That website, that was called Pyrenees. Pyrenees was using Prologue in the background to make decisions about whether or not to show you an example or give you another problem, right? It was making the decision based on a lot of its rules and policies. So what, okay, okay. and I will go ahead and point out, you know, SWI prologue, that's what you need for your lecture exercise for. So, you know, you have to do it for a grade. Don't, don't give me that look. That, oh. For a grade. <laughs> Anyways, my point being, so. <laughs> moving on. <laughs> so this is where I'm going to do a very, very brief introduction to Prologue, mostly in the sense of a lot of this, you've been computer science students for a couple semesters now, at least a couple, right? So 
at that point, a lot of this hopefully is, you know, secondary to you. But, okay, well, what can Prolog use? Specifically, it uses terms. Well, what are terms? Terms can be numbers, literally, you know, ones and zeros. But it can also be what they call atoms. And specifically with those atoms, here's where they can be strings or if I want to just say there exists some thing out there in my universe, the Kowalskis, the Tweety Birds, the Sylvesters, right? They just exist. The atoms are existing. I just call this one X, right? This is not a variable. This is, there's just a thing in my universe, an entity, if you will, a little amorphous entity named X. But then what? Right? Case in point, they are lowercase. I know that, you know, the, the string there isn't lowercase, but if you want to have just a thing existing in your universe, lowercase. Because variables are uppercase. This is a little bit of a swap between what my slides are doing, and I've, I'm trying to, like, you know, warm you into this. But, oh, you know, a capital X, that's a variable. Capital cat, that's a variable. Capital var with an underscore, variable. These are things that, oh, now I'm just like, again, you, you know what a variable is. I mean, I don't, right? Last one, compound terms. Now, you might notice those look eerily similar. This is where, yeah, you're, you're doing a lot of the same things as a programming language, but they're slightly different, right? Oh, I could have a list. I could have Michael works with Pam Jim. Pam Jim in a list, right? It could be more, could be less. But again, this is just our way of establishing that I have uh, these, or, you know, the, these compound terms. This is allowing me to have some term associated with some other term, right? This is that function that we were just talking about. So why we present that is now that I have it built. I can now produce facts to my universe. I can produce Tom as a cat, Adam as a student. I know I'm a doctor, but I am a forever student. Lifelong learner is what they call me, right? And so these just exist now in my universe. Where do I have you up? I don't have you up. Oh, right, I got to. All right, everyone say bye to chat. They don't ever respond anyway, right? So if we're looking at SWI Prolog, uh, again, it's this nice little terminal, but you can see I can start to build out different structures. Uh, but specifically, let's arbitrarily say I've got that, what am I calling him? Tom is a cat, uh, student Adam. We save those. Um, no. I was, for examples, prolog, uh, example.pl, boom. Oh, look at that, nice, right? It, it forms it. Let me consult that knowledge base. It's not a big knowledge base, but hey, let me consult that knowledge base. Where's my example? Oh, it's on my desktop, different spot. Example. Oh, look, it, it, it loaded it. It, it. it said, OK, let me bring you up a little bit so I can max, uh, bring you up. And so now what I have is the ability to make queries. So hey, what things could be cats in my knowledge base? Notice, hey, cat with a capital X. I've essentially established, I want to make a query. And it will already deduce it for me. It'll go, oh, hey, you know, if you were to do that substitution of swapping out X with Tom, that would be a true statement. If I went in and said, hey, is Tom a student? Well, no. That fact doesn't exist in my knowledge base. I don't have anything going on there. If, let me just add Sylvester back to this, uh, cat Sylvester. 
Boom. Uh, reload the modified files. One more was going on. That Yeah, it's complaining just because it likes them to be in order. Hey, what kind of cats can I make? Oh, well, it's telling me, Tom. Am I done? No. I'm going to hit the comma. That's not the one. Uh, what, what, what? Semicolon. There, thank you. Semicolon. <laughs> right? Oh, you can swap X with Tom, or you can swap X with Sylvester, and it would resolve to true. Right? That's where this is coming into play. And so you can see, again, I can create these facts uh, and these rules. Uh, and so that's what, uh, when you build them, when you establish them, you're stating that this is a true fact. So why we keep on building these is specifically, there's all that stuff, is now we can also produce rules. I showed you facts. But what, are, what good are facts if I can't kind of build more complex Rule sets, which are just collections of facts. And so maybe I want to do that chasing structure. Maybe I want to do it work off of that. I could say, well, for some variable cat to chase some variable bird, this is where we're moving off of logic into syntax land. That's the implication. Well, bird will need to be a bird and cat will need to be a cat. You've done this before. Person P equals new person in Java, right? You've done very similar things. So person, person equals new person. So we're doing that same kind of concept going on here. And as you can see, hey, you know, I could ask, well, what do, would Sylvester chase? Well, if I happen to have that knowledge base, you can see I could say, oh, it would be Kowalski. I dropped off the yellow thing for this. Or Tweety. Uh, let's cat bird this up. So now we've got that knowledge base. Oh, look, I've built the structure that we were just seeing in the knowledge base. Yes, I still have yellow here, uh, but you can see there's the Qs, there's the Zs. Let's take this and let's consult Catbird. Built it out. Uh, and let's say, hey, Sylvester, some bird. What birds would Sylvester chase? Chases, yes. Oh, bird Kowalski, semicolon, bird Tweety. Look at that, look at that. Now, yes, that's because I have Kowalski being yellow. That's why that worked. If I were to drop that, reload that. Yes, only one Substitution would work. And what else can we do for this? Uh, so uh, you can overload. This is where it's me just kind of showing off other things that you can kind of build off of this. So you can have an overload as well. So now maybe it's not just cats and dogs, but or sorry, cats and birds, but it's also cats and dogs, right? Oh, a dog will chase a cat if the dog is a dog and the cat is a cat. Ah, right, you can do, you can build those things up. Uh, or you can use some, this is where it's a, you're going to come to my office hours with these questions. You're building conditional statements effectively. But here's the problem. In Java, that's the or. That's not the or in prologue, different language. If you want to say and, you use a comma, not double ampersand. If you want to use an or, semicolon. And so what I've essentially done here is rather than overload that method or that rule, right, now I've said, oh, let's make it more generic. Oh, you know, animal one will chase animal two if and only if uh, animal one is a bird and animal two is a cat or animal one is a cat and animal two is a dog. Those should be swapped. I'll fix that. Right. Or, you know, you can just let cats chase dogs. 
if and only if? It, it's the implies symbol. So you can think before we were doing sort of the implication in logic, we replace it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So why we keep on kind of building off of this, and this is some a lot of just me demonstrating the different types that we've done. You can build every type of structure, uh, all of the examples that I've been showing you of logic so far. Yeah, they work. We can do them again, right? You can see, hey, I can do wallet uh, or Wally robot T24. Wally is located at T24, and then ask that same question that we saw on Monday. Who cleans what? We can bake these same kinds of structures. There's the Sylvester Tweedy, but this is where we get into some of the more funky structures or the funkier rules. So if I were to look at my family, right, I could design out uh, the same kind of structure. So these, this is a very super common one uh, that's been that gets thrown around when you see prologue all the time. But hey, you know, Trudy is the mother to some child named Sally. Tom is the father to some child Sally. Tom is the father to some child Erica. Tom is the father of some child Andrew. Tom, or Mike is the father of some t child Tom. Ugh. But then what's, okay, those are just facts. What are the rules? Well, how would I base, uh, did y'all learn about family trees in 316? Did we give you that example? We did not. All right. So you understand how family works, right? Family works. Thank you. Thank you. No, so very quickly, not, not to like educate you on how family works. My idea is, right, if you have some child, it has some parent, right? So how would I establish a sibling? Oh, well, there are rules to that, specifically that we have to have two parents, right? You, to perform a child, you got to have two parents. And specifically, oh, right, Z has to be the parent of X. Z also has to be the parent of Y. And X and Y should not equal each other, right? I am not my own sibling. I'm myself. But what that allows me to do is, once again, we come in, we make those same consultations. Where's family? Family. Boom. All right, we, we load that up, and then we go, well, who are Sally's siblings? Erica is Sally's sibling, right? Because if we look, Tom is uh, the father of Erica, but Tom is also the father of Sally. So we've Made that rule. Also, sibling Andrew. Also, no more else. No more else. Uh, yeah, because Sally can 